Hi everyone, uh, Paul here and I wanted to say a few words about Terence Conran whose death was announced yesterday. I had the great good fortune to meet Terence Conran on a number of occasions, not least uh, when I sold him a poster <laughs> for Michelin tyres and also after he offered us the opportunity to have a pop-up shop at Butler's Wharf which was very exciting and we did that in the early 1990s when south of the river east of Tower Bridge was still a long way from central London. We learnt a lot of really valuable lessons about business, about running a gallery, about dealing with clients relatively inexpensively and the subsequent success of our shop which has now been going for 30 years is down in no small measure to the help that Sir Terence was able to uh, offer us in a very informal way. So I salute him for that. The thing about Terence Conran is that he exemplified an attitude of mind, particularly in relation to design, which is quite unusual in the UK. And he stands at the end of a tradition of design reform, which begins with John Ruskin and William Morris in the 19th century and sought to improve the daily lives and experience of people through design by making things better and helping people to understand the aesthetic, sculptural and emotional qualities that can attach to really quite modest uh, elements of everyday life. I call this the exquisite everyday and for various reasons it's an idea and a concept about how we organise, how we could organise life, which is a bit unusual in the UK. But Sir Terence Conran was able uh, in the 1960s and 70s and into the 80s and 90s as well. He was able to mobilise the developing consumer society and then um, the food economy to promote uh, a lifestyle which was certainly anything but punitive. It was enjoying, it, enjoyable, it was richly textured, it was sophisticated. And because of his interest in retail and economies of scale, he was able to m make that available to a much wider range of people than had hitherto been possible. If you look at the history of design reform, it, it begins with William Morris and it founders on the it founders on the difficulty of making beautiful things inexpensively enough so that the critical mass of their production can have a philosophical and political effect beyond the immediate group of artisans and consumers and patrons and so on. Uh, the second wave of design reform in education was pioneered by William Leatherby, who was the founder of the Central School, uh, which where I have the great honour of working at present, now called Central St Martins. And then after Leatherby came the second wave of design reform, uh, in which industrial processes and, and aggregation were mobilised to drive society forward, Ambrose Heal and Frank Pick are the names associated with that. And Terence Conran comes after them and at a historical moment when <clears throat> in the aftermath of the Second World War Britain needed all the help it could get. Uh, Conran began life, uh, his professional life, as a designer uh, designing fabrics and ceramics and bits of furniture for patios and so on and so forth. He was one of the first people after the Second World War to rediscover continental Europe, particularly France and Italy, and to bring back lovely things, whether they were bits of metalware, pottery or, or food. And for Conran, the link between the material world and our experience of the food economy was always very close. Um, it's no accident, I think, that Conran designed a range of a number of ranges of china for midwinter this is 
part of their style craft range from the 1950s and it's called saladware we've got a bit of a dinner service of this uh, and here's a book <coughs> that terence conran produced on um oh, <laughs> terence conran produced uh, on how to design textiles and how to manufacture them in a small way so even in the 1950s this book was published i think in let's have a look 1957 uh, he was interested and had and had attached himself to one of the key drivers of, of social change in in the post-war period in Britain which was the the expansion of home ownership and in the 60s that accelerated because there'd been an enormous expansion in the university sector so university graduates young professionals began to move in increasing numbers towards London and to attach themselves to the legal profession, the financial markets, the new businesses in media, cinema, television and so on. And uh, Conran serviced those people and their relatively sophisticated and international tastes through a series of small restaurants and uh, the development of his Habitat shop. And the Habitat shop was one of the key retail environments in London at the end of the 1960s and in the 70s it ranks up there with Bieber and with the way in at Harrods to and it gave people a template of that they could see and experience of how they might live slightly differently not too differently it wasn't about the 21st century back then it was about making a life that was was not the same life as your parents had had and that was richer more textured more comfortable and less expensive i think than than the life that had been available to your parents and that was an amazing achievement the the concept shift in retail was driven by uh, an idea in architecture that derived from cedric price's fun palace which was a, a multimedia multifunctional theater space that cedric designed for joan littlewood's um, avant-garde theater troupe the fun palace in its original form was never built in the uk but it informed new kinds of retail retail where you could go in wander around see things touch things experience things and see if you like them and then reinvent your own life accordingly i think bieber is probably the best known of those retail environments but habitat was a second and at a slightly more elevated non-retail form richard rogers and renzo piano's more a beaubourg center in paris which opened in the mid 70s uh, did the same thing for culture and so terence conran is part of a very very important trajectory of development in the second half of the 20th century from the 1990s onwards conran moved from retail into restaurants and his success in restaurants shouldn't be underestimated he he brought a large scale brasserie style restaurants to london and it, historically they've never really worked in london in the same way that they do in Paris and New York. It's difficult to explain exactly why. It's something to do with the locations and the and, and the planning system of how London works. But it's been it was very difficult and and Conran was the first person to really have a go at that, particularly at Butler's Wharf, where he opened uh, the Pont de la Tour and quickly afterwards an italian restaurant and then the Lund and then the chop house restaurant and so there was a river frontage of of restaurant e restaurant experiences which were all slightly different but the same and you could hang out and and live there and work there and, and enjoy food wine and and all of the things that make up the exquisite every day so i want to salute Terence Conran. I want to say that he was been, has been an inspiration to us and has led by example and 
it was a jolly good example and I'm very grateful to have had that opportunity. I'll just now show you the poster that we sold him. Uh, the, the eponymous Conran shop, of course, was in the Bibendum building, the old Michelin tire warehouse in the Fulham Road. And so uh, Conran had um, put all his main businesses into the redevelopment of that building. So there was a shop, there was a restaurant, there was an office block with his publishing house uh, and design factory as well. There was a larger version of what he'd done in um, in Covent Garden around the restaurant with uh, Carluccio and so on. Um, this is the, the poster that we found. It's the one on uh, with the spare tire <laughs> and the word Michelin. Uh, it's by René Vincent from 1914. And uh, we bought it and uh, thought, well, who do we know who's interested in, in Michelin and Bibendum? And we thought of Terence Conran and we wrote him a nice letter and said, we've got this thing, you might be interested. And, and he said, oh yeah, bring it up. So we delivered it up to Butler's Wharf and uh, that was the beginning of, of an amazing adventure and I'm, I'm very, very grateful. Thank you, Sir Terence. Bye bye. <laughs>